where did the social networks come from, both as an idea in mathematics and as a visualization? This is what we're going to be considering in the last portion of our introductory lecture for ComSoc 375 Social Networks at the University of Maine at Augusta. I'd like to begin with this image uh, of the city of Königsberg, which was in Prussia, uh, is now uh, called Kaliningrad in uh, the, the country of Russia. Leonhard Euler, a mathematician, lived in Königsberg, and in the year 1736, he was engaged in an activity of taking his morning walks. He found that he was crossing a number of bridges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven bridges, if you can find them. And as he was walking across these bridges, he often found he had to cross back over one in order to get back to his home. And he thought to himself, hmm, I wonder why do I always have to cross back across one of the bridges I, I, I went across? Is it possible for me to make a trip from one point coming back to another point, crossing over each of the bridges just once? Now, if he was a normal individual, Euler would have simply thought about this and wondered and tried it out in different ways with different walks, and he did a little bit of that, but he was not an entirely normal individual. He was a mathematician, an abstract thinker, and he wanted to think about why uh, he couldn't figure it out thinking about the city as a city and how he could think about the city in a different way that would allow him to simplify the problem and come up with the solution. His first step was to recognize that in the city of Königsberg there are four land masses, a couple of islands, some uh, uh, land masses connected to the rest of Europe, all connected by bridges. And these he idealized as simple circles. Then he drew the paths that one could take from one of those land masses to the other within the city of Königsberg. These are paths, and each of them crosses a bridge. Finally, he completely abstracted that, saying, well, let's not take a look at the actual path we took, but consider each one of those paths to be a line. When we do that, uh, Euler showed his friends, we have simplified the problem uh, and showed that actually it's not possible to get from Euler's home back to his home, uh, crossing each one of the bridges without doubling back at least once. In doing so, he created graph theory. And the people who read Leonhard Euler's work began to think about how that could be applied, lines and circles, to understand other kinds of phenomena. The people who started thinking about social networks noticed that when you think about social relationships, lines and circles look like a net, a fisherman's net. That's why it's called a network. And they developed his ideas further to apply to social relationships. But it didn't have to be that way. The historical development of social networks followed multiple tracks in psychology, in anthropology, in sociology. In psychology, Jacob Moreno started a journal called Sociometry. And if you think about this sociologically, what is a journal? It is uh, a place. It is an organization uh, that academics commit to through a subscription returning to again and again and again multiple times a year, reading one another's work, uh, responding to one another's work. Moreno creates the idea in sociometry, the metrics of society, of a sociogram, and he links back to Euler when doing so. He builds a community of people who read his work uh, and respond to it as well. Elaine Forsyth and Leo Katz in the first half of the 20th century respond to Jacob Moreno by saying, you know, 
that's wonderful lines and and, and circles, but it's a little unsystematic, as both uh, Prell and Hansen will have referred to. You can do a lot of things with those circles and lines, move them all over, and there's no rhyme or reason, no principle for how you create that. It's more an art. Let's be more mathematical about it. Let's refer back to matrix theory and matrix algebra. Uh, and there are entire courses you can take as an undergraduate on matrices and the mathematics of them. More recently in the psychological track, Richard Emerson, Karen Cook, and social psychologist Linda Malm, uh, bridging to sociology, have talked about how uh, power can emerge in networks because some individuals in a network are more dependent on other individuals in a network, and some uh, have less dependence. That is, they have more alternatives, and they've spoken about networks of exchange. In the anthropological track, the concern has been mostly about kinship and genealogy, who's related to who, who marries whom, or in trying to understand the structure of a society going to a completely foreign place and conducting an ethnography, participant observation, and s showing the spread of ideas. Uh, so kinship, genealogy, uh, leadership, uh, all of these are charted in anthropology through the use of social networks and sociograms. In sociology, in the, in the meantime, people were thinking about social facts based on Emile Durkheim and his idea in the 1800s that a social fact is something that stems from relations uh, between individuals and between groups, not the attributes of those groups, like how tall they are, uh, or where, or what building a, a group meets in, or how tall an individual person is, how smart an individual person is. Durkheim says social facts come from relations. The problem is how do you visualize relations? What does a relationship look like? Well, that's when sociologists started to read psychology and anthropology, came across the idea that they were working on there of the social network. But it, it didn't have to be that way. At the beginning of the 20th century, uh, a, a social thinker, Georg Zimmel, uh, in Germany, was writing a book called Die Kreuzung Sozialer Kreise. Translated into English, that would be the intersection of social circles. Now, a social circle has an alternative visualization of affiliation. The idea is that a circle is a group, anything to which a person belongs. And all individuals who are within that group are within that circle. There may be another group, and perhaps there are some people who are in both groups. We'll find that they are situated at the overlapping region between two social circles, kind of like a Venn diagram, except that Zimmel then says the whole structure of a society can be seen as a froth of these social circles, all interweaving with one another, all overlapping with one another. And if you want to understand why societies develop the way they do, you have to look at the structure, uh, the placement of those circles, one on top of another, some of them inside, wholly inside one another, like the Lions Club and the Lions Auxiliary, or the United States Senate and a Senate subcommittee. That is a different way of thinking about circles, which are in social networks, and what circles mean. Uh, it's, a it, it's a different way of thinking about individuals, completely subsumed within the border of a circle, multiple individuals. Uh, yet that didn't really uh, take off in the consideration of social networks, even though Zimmel is quoted and cited to this day as an important thinker. His image didn't take off. Why don't we think about networks in terms of rectangular layouts? You'll see here from two papers that are cited right here by uh, Gianluca uh, Quercini and Massimo Ancona, Adam Bushbaum, and a number of other authors. First on the left, you'll see a sociogram talking about relationships between nodes. 
um, excuse me, ties between nodes of a relationship uh, that we, we, we don't understand. It could be friendships between people. Uh, it could be messages sent between different uh, committees or uh, super PACs, perhaps, sending each other money, any of those things. But on the right-hand side, you will see it's rectangular dual. There's that word dual again, which you saw in the text referred to uh, with uh, reference to Ron Breiger. Dual meaning another way of seeing a network in which there are rectangles, and the rectangles that touch one another are adjacent to one another are the ones that impact one another. They're next to one another, literally, in these rectangles. Why don't we see networks thought of as adjacent rectangles? Why don't we think about networks as waves? Uh, we could think about a drop of water. When it falls from the sky and hits a lake, that's an initial communication. But what happens when it hits the water? It sends out waves that spread out from the original source. They spread through a medium. These waves can reinforce each other when they're traveling in the same direction. They can cancel each other out when they hit each other in opposite directions. Waves are something that we're familiar with in our lives. Waves have an effect when they reach us in the water, as tsunamis or tides. We hear them through the air as sound. We can see them through space from millions of miles away as light. Our lives depend on that light which travels in waves. These are communications across space from a source to a destination that's compatible with thinking about social relations why haven't we thought of social relationships as waves why didn't leonhard euler think about that when he was crossing his bridges if he had looked over the side and seen that there were waves maybe he would have developed a new way of thinking about his trip and his travel Maybe he thought about lines because he was walking on a bridge. From Leonhard Euler on, my point is that social networks could have been visualized differently or even given a different name altogether. Social waves had ideas about connection and affiliation spread from a different place and a different time by a different person who enjoyed their morning walk in a different context.